Well, first off, guys, I'm so pleased to see you. Everybody's got a nice smile on their face, even uh, the goat. <laughs> <laughs> and and so um, today we can start off talking about uh, Eric Burns book Games People Play. And that I'm uh, I haven't actually read the books. <laughs> probably now in close to 50 years. <laughs> uh, but it it struck me so much so that I remember quite a lot of the games and things like that. And so the point that we started talking about was the issue of time structuring, that we all have to structure our time even unstructured time is structured time. Uh, how is it structured? You got to be here now or you got to be in the present moment. This is it. Time just rolls on. There's just always a now. Um, then, in fact, we can think of time in two different ways. One is, is that there's just a perpetual now. It just keeps rolling on and rolling on and rolling on. And then, um, which is quite natural, animals live like that. Um, primitive tribes live like that. Humanity lived like that up until about 500 years ago. And then something was invented. It was called a clock. And now our uh, humanity lives on clock time, which means the past and the future. And we've come out of the now. But Eric Byrne there is talking about how do we structure our time? How do we structure right now? What are the various ways that we can, in fact, spend our time? Um, and that one of the ways to spend time is to play psychological games with people. Gotchas, one-upmanships. Um, uh, some of the games are quite telling in their name alone, like let's pull a fast one on joy. Let's go trick somebody. Okay, let's or make joy our victim. That in fact, that's the favorite game of the bully. Let's go pull a fast one on that 14 year old kid. All right. We don't intend to hurt him. We just intend to put him in a in a bad psychological state. OK, so um, this is the kind of uh, in, in fact, um, immigration officers often will play that kind of game, especially if it's been a busy, busy day. And they act grumpy for no reason at all. So if you go at one time a day or at one particular time, you can make best friends with this person. And at another time of the day, you, you don't want to be around them at all. And we're all like that, uh, that when things pile on, we pile back. And so this is the whole point about the psychological games, like an example of the immigration officer is going to stamp that visa, but he's going to give us a hard time before he does. <laughs> uh, gives them a feeling of power, of being on top of the game, of being a winner. This is part of the reason why people play these games is to establish the one-upmanship or the top dog underdog, which was actually a, um, a very famous concept that was invented by Fritz Perls, who was a friend of Eric Burns. OK, and so uh, this top dog underdog concept. We play that out our whole lives. Then, in fact, the question is, is how much time do you spend as a top dog and how much time do you spend as an underdog? We are trained, in fact, we are born as an underdog. Every child is born a victim. No child can take care of himself. Not one three-year, excuse me, one three-day-old child is ready to get, enroll in university. <laughs> a one-week-old child is simply not ready to ride a bicycle or play baseball. 
And yet, here's uh, here's one of Eric Burns' favorite jokes, and that is you've got the maternity ward, and the new daddies are all there at the maternity ward giving gifts. And some of them are bringing baseball mat mitts, baseballs, baseball bats, footballs, helmets, and the kind of stuff that that child is not ready for at all because the child is too young. But daddy's not living in the present moment. He's living off into the future. In fact, he is living vicariously. It's not the child who he brings that baseball mitt to. It's himself. Okay. But we all start off as tender infants, and we are completely dependent. And then when we get school age, we wind up continuingly to be dependent and continuously we are the victim. And uh, the vic what are we victim to? We're victim to being told what to do. Do your homework. Do your ABCs. Do your one, two, threes. Clean up your room. And so every child is moved from the curiousness that every child at about one year to 18 months, two years old, is extremely curious. We all just wanted to get into everything. And then over and over again, it was taken away from us. You've got your toys. You can't play with the remote. That kind of thing. And so we remained victims. Um, many societies have it set up as a rite of passage so that they know, the kid knows when it is time to grow up. But that's very soft. It's not specific in Western culture. That in fact, in the old days, the bar mitzvah for the Jewish boy at the age of 12, that was the markation of now you're an adult. Now you have to play adult games. Now you have to be, uh, let us say, coming out of your child's victim's position into being a fully adult capable of living your life. Now, the ones that I know of that do this the strongest are more primitive societies. And an example is the American uh, Native American tradition of uh, the American Indians will often take the young buck as a teenager and intentionally put him in the wilderness for one moon, 30 days, or um, a moon cycle, and he's got to make it on his own out there. I think that some of the tribes will give the kid a knife. Others will give bows and arrows. Others will actually put a tiny little tree house just big enough in the tree for safety, but not big enough for comfort. And he's got to spend 30 days out there. And when he comes back, if he comes back early, he comes back in shame. But if he comes back as uh, after the 30 days, that means that now he's a brave. Now he can manage in other primitive societies going way back when that that rite of passage often happened at a very early age, for instance, about six years old, that a six year old is capable of learning how to manage a slingshot, a bow and arrow. And that he can also keep his eyes open and so the little boy will no longer stay with mommy and the ladies of the tribe and the other kids. When he gets about six years old, he becomes a hunter. He goes out with the men. He's a big boy now. OK, and that um, it's often done with a ceremony and a rite of passage. In our society, we have lost track of that, and so we have several substitutes for that. One of them would be joining the military, that in fact, that's one that should work. That boot camp is going to put that kid under so much pressure that he's either going to wash out or grow up. And a lot of them wind up both doing both. <laughs> or actually, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so um, other things would be like getting married, getting a job, going to college, graduating from college, whatever like that. But these are soft. What I mean by soft is, is that the kid never gets the idea. Now that I've got this piece of paper, I'm a man. He never gets that. OK, and so we wind up being victims for the rest of our lives. We stay too much, spending too much of our time structuring our time as an underdog. And we don't spend our time as being on top of the game. So when we get fussed at, we shrink. When somebody calls us a name, we shrink. Why? Because that we see that other person as the top dog especially if it's a formality situation. And uh, the example that I'm using here is the example of someone doing a retreat, trying to talk to a volunteer, and the volunteer <laughs> plays a psychological game. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can see where Daniel's going. Yeah, you can see where this is going. <laughs> All right. So um, we we shrink with that because we have maintained to that childhood position or we go back into that childhood position of being the victim, that we are victimized by other people. And the whole process of uh, the development through uh, either psychology or through uh, Buddha Dhamma or whatever it is that we have to then train ourselves to spend less time structuring in inappropriate, unwholesome things like being a victim, victimhood and playing victimhood games and start structuring our time to be more of a winner. OK, now, in that regard, one of the one of the ways that Eric Byrne talks about time structure, I think he's got five different items. Uh, those of you who have got the book, you can keep track of what we're talking about here. But one of the ways of structuring time is called work or activities. That we're actually engaged with something and we don't have our mind on the present moment or upon me or upon the self, or upon the future or the past, that we're actually engaged in doing something, okay? An example of, of that would be calling an email list, or removing duplicate files. These are the kind of things that we do now as adults that is time structuring, um, writing a report, Whatever we're doing, we're engaged with that to the point that we're not thinking about how we feel. We're not thinking about the posture. We're not thinking about anything about the present moment. The mind is completely focused on some activity. That's one of the ways of structuring our time. The question now is, is that how much time do we spend structuring our time in activities? I mean, that's what's supposed to be done at work, right? You're supposed to go and work eight hours a day. You're paid to work eight hours a day. How much time is actually spent working? 20%? 5%? The rest of the time is not spent in activities. It's spent in psychological games, worrying, uh, arguing or talking to um, other people. But um, we, we don't actually pay attention to how we're structuring our time. So as at the process of waking up, I would say that part of the thing to do is from time to time, remember to evaluate how are you structuring your time? What activities do you do? What other ways do you have of spending time? Now, um, Daniel, which I don't see now, he must have gotten off. He, he's the one that introduced the book. Um, he, he mentioned intimacy. 
mm. which is one of one of Eric Burns' uh, ways of structuring time. Now, um, the word intimacy has been ruined by the church because just like the word love, love and intimacy are often too, um, let us say, sexually oriented. That in fact, in the 1960s, getting intimacy required you to take your clothes off. But Er Eric Byrne was coming from an older generation, and so he was using the word intimacy more appropriately. Now, how we can uh, reclaim the word intimacy is b by using the word openness, that intimacy, time of intimacy is when we're open. And that intimacy is actually the goal of the practice of, well, let us say at least metta. Metta is actually the practice of learning to be open and intimate, real, getting into reality, that in fact, the ultimate intimacy is to be real with reality, to actually merge with the way things actually are, rather than a conceptual reality or a desired reality. That the real reality actually takes some work on, and that basically has to do with um, our senses. our eyes, our ears, our taste. So in fact, it's possible that you can eat an ice cream cone on the way to work or listening to someone, et cetera, like that, and all of a sudden the ice cream cone is gone. Or you can become intimate with that ice cream cone. And you know every lick you know every uh, bit about it. When you go into eating the cone, the first part of the taste of the cone is different from the ice cream, and we're quite familiar with it. We slow things down is another quality of intimacy, okay? That we become intimate with the moment. To become really here now is what Byrne is referring to as intimacy, and we can do that with a friend, with a partner that in fact in a way we could say that the time that we're spending right now together is a time of intimacy why because the folks here are actually listening they're actually open to what's going on and listening and being in the present moment that that's one of the shifts that we need to make when we're practicing anapanasati or meditation off in private and we're getting, basically getting our act together, basically getting our stuff together. The Buddha was actually big on getting things together. That togetherness then is a kind of intimacy, okay? And so he calls it or refers to it as unification of mind, that when you become intimate with yourself, when you become uh, in that here now, and just experiencing what it is to experience. But then we go out into the world and that we want to actually begin to practice that intimacy with other people. Now that doesn't mean that we go to, uh, <laughs> we go get undressed with everybody that we meet. That's uh, an immature way of looking at it. But the word intimacy here means friendship. It means meta, it means being there with people. And one of the qualities of that has to do with listening, because very, very rarely are we taught actually how to listen. What we do instead is pause while the other person is talking to give ourselves a chance to think up what we're going to say next. And so we're not really listening to, to someone that in fact we want to interrupt them. We want to put something in. We want to um, take a stab at it, et cetera. So intimacy though, is to actually be able to listen. Now in a way, 
Eric, Eric Byrne talks about the whole point about his book is uh, the, the point of gaining strokes. Intimacy is a way of getting strokes. In fact, the one of the terms that was used was uh, actually it's a twin term. One is cold, prickly and warm, fuzzy. OK, so warm fuzzies. We don't give out much, but we give out cold pricklies to people a lot. What is a cold prickly? Well, whatever is said, the the, the feeling that is uh, that we gain is is that this is a put off. It's cold. It's it's uh, uh, uncomfortable, as opposed to a warm fuzzy. Okay, that we like warm fuzzies. We like compliments. We like people to tell us. Think good things about ourselves. So what Byrne is actually doing here is, is that he's referring to things at an ordinary level, but this is the level that ordinary people live at in the sense of going around looking for warm fuzzies and co and uh, trying to avoid cold pricklies from other people. And the noble way that we're talking about this is, is that we need to learn to stop giving ourselves cold pricklies, to stop criticizing ourselves, to start nurturing ourselves and giving ourselves warm fuzzies. That in fact, so long as we're giving ourselves cold pricklies, as long as we're giving ourselves criticism, we're going to keep ourselves in a state of victimhood. That we keep putting the, ourselves down, trying to make ourselves better, trying to improve. That in fact, everyone who comes to meditation, every one of us who comes to meditation, is looking for uh, warm fuzzies and trying to avoid cold pricklies. And then we don't get the right instructions on how to do that. But the Buddha was actually quite big. I know that he uses a different language, but this is exactly what the Buddha was talking about when he says unwholesome thoughts. So unwholesome thoughts in Eric Burns vocabulary is cold pricklies. And uh, uh, wholesome thoughts are referred to as warm fuzzies or stroking. And in fact, to be honest with you guys, right now, Lucky is sitting beside me. You can see my shoulder bent over. That's because I'm petting her. And when I stop petting her, she'll take her nose and slap my hand saying, come back and pet me some more. <laughs> and, and, and so um, um, also I'm in the process of finding ticks and removing them. And so I'm getting some work done and she enjoys that. And so this is you can think of then as petting a dog or petting a, a, a pet. In fact, we call them a pet because we pet them. What is that petting? Then it's the stroking that Byrne is talking about, that when we are tender infants, we want to be touched. We want to be picked up and held. We want to be rocked. We want contact. <laughs> and so intimacy then is contact to be in touch with and the best place to think to be in touch with is our own inner nature and our own reality this is where we learn to be intimate with ourselves if we could be intimate with ourselves that gives us a chance to be intimate with other people and this is the way that we want to learn to structure our time is less in the sense of activities or work and more in the way of intimacy or playing games. Now, another way that, that Byrne talks about structuring our time and some societies do this a whole lot more than others, and that is ritual that we do spend a certain amount of time uh, rituals. Then, in fact, every time that we start up one of our um, uh, calls here on Friday night, we do it starting with a ritual. Anytime that you meet people, we do it with a ritual. Hi, how are you doing? How are you feeling? 
what's going on. We have all of these kind of ritual words that we use, and then the format that we use is often ritualized in the sense of um, one person is the designated jawbone, and everybody else is designated ears. Okay, that's a ritual that we're playing here. And you guys didn't possibly even know that, that we're, while we're playing an intimacy game, we're also playing rituals. We ritualize our game playing. We ritualize everything. Um, but in fact, the guy who has the most organized desk at the company spends more time in rituals in general than other people. Because how did he get his desk so well organized? It was ritualized. Okay, a lot of the work that we do is also ritualized that we just do it over and over again, kind of mindlessly, but we go through the motions. Now, one of the things about rituals that are very valuable, and that is, is that the subject or the intent of the ritual is wholesome, then we will get wholesome results. But if the ritual is done um, in an ordinary way, expecting ordinary results, it will always wind up in ripening and clinging. This is the statement that the Buddha makes is, is that ordinary ways of doing things always ripens in clinging. So let me give you an example of that. Would be someone who is ordaining, doesn't matter where he's ordaining, there's dozens of different religions. And so we don't have to even mention any of them, but Buddhism and Christianity, especially, um, um, ordaining as a priest is highly ritualized. And part of the ritual has to do with um, renunciation. What do I mean by renouncing? Renunciation means I will not do money. Some take vows of silence, vows of poverty. We also have vows of um, marriage of fidelity okay why do these things um ripen in clinging is because we're saying off in advance i'm going to stop doing something that i have been doing all along simply because of some formality is some ceremony Okay, another example of that would be pledge allegiance to the flag this is actually a very indicating one why? Because the reason that these rituals are performed, it started back in the 1950. In fact, I remember in 1954, I was a kid at church when they actually had to reteach us to put God in that Pledge of Allegiance. It was written into law. Why? Because of the communism, okay? Um, and, and so I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Right now, why do we have these pledge of allegiances? This as a, especially as a ritual. Uh, another way of thinking about it is, is that the pledge of allegiance is actually an induction into military because it's actually they do that to the four-year-old kids to get them ready to become patriots. And so we do these rituals over and over and over again to indoctrinate. The question is, what are we indoctrinating into? Into, into a, a, a wedding, into a ceremony, or are we actually using wholesome rituals that indoctrinate the children into wholesome activities? And so think about what kind mandatory? of, pardon? So mandatory to uh, be the pledge of allegiance in class? Or? I'm not quite sure of what you're saying. Yes, every uh, morning. Sorry. You have to do it. You have to, they get upset if you don't. <laughs> okay. They get pretty upset with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, oftentimes they'll actually remove you from the classroom. Which I always found to be so funny because why are you going to school except to sit in the classroom? And I've had students. No. 
1954, none of us were brave enough to buck that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and so that Pledge of Allegiance is a ritual that's designed to get the kids to do this over and over and over again until it finally takes hold. And the I would taking just mouth of the words. Pardon? I wouldn't actually say it. I would just mouth the words, pretending I was saying it as a kid. <laughs> actually, secretly, we changed the words, and we changed. I don't remember what we did with that, but I do remember a whole lot of others. Uh, 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 one of them would be. Uh, Holy, 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 my socks are holy. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot what we did to change the Pledge of Allegiance, but we really did mess it up intentionally as kids. And so, um, so these are the ways that we could structure our time. Working, rituals, intimacy, Game playing is the one that I left out because I think that there's five. Spontaneity. Spontaneity. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, spontaneity and um, uh, intimacy are really closely related. They're both pretty wholesome to where work and rituals and game playing is often unwholesome. And one thing that he goes on to say is that spontaneity and intimacy are often uh, ruined by adapting to our parents' teachings. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's amazing how close Eric Byrne was to the teachings of the Buddha in so many things. It's hard for he me to even says, tell them apart. <laughs> I know. I remember reading it to you when I found it. I was so excited. I'd love to talk about it because in there he even says that when we play a game, we discount four things. We discount that there is a problem. We discount that there is a cause to the problem. We discount there is a solution to the problem. And we discount that there's a path to the solution to the problem. And those four truths are apparently universal, huh? Yes, they are. In fact, you just take the word uh, problem out and you've got the four noble truths. Mm -hmm. Or if you redefine problems as dukkha, because a problem is what? We're dissatisfied with something. Okay. And so Burke, Eric Byrne, on his own, came up with the Four Noble Truths expressed in his own way, in the sense of this is why we play games, is because we do not know the actual uh, cause of the problem. Mm hmm. And the actual cause of the problem is, is that we made up the problem. That's the cause of it. <laughs> <laughs> and why did and why and how did we make up the problem? Is because we wanted something. And so it goes right back to the feelings. And so I would say that while Eric Byrne had a really good, strong handle on psychology and the Four Noble Truths and that kind of stuff, he missed some of the details that the Buddha had picked up on. And that is the source of all of these problems is feelings. All of our clinging, all of our desires, all of our wanting is based upon the way that we feel. And the next point is, is that victims don't have control over the way they feel. At least they don't think so. The reality is, is that we have every one of us from infancy has had control over the way that we feel. We've always had that, but we're under the delusion that we don't have any ability to control our feelings. Look what he did to me. He made me feel bad. He called me up tight and angry. The best way to get me to feel uptight and angry is by saying that I'm uptight and angry. <laughs> <laughs> Until I recognize that being called uptight and angry doesn't have to make me feel uptight and angry. I still choose to do that. 
that this is our choice, every one of them. So now we're beginning to also see that we have choice over how we're going to structure our time if we begin to look at it. If we begin to notice, how do we structure our time? Do we play games? Are we trying to get some psych kind of psychological reward at someone else's expense? Because uh, Eric Byrne will point out that in many cultures, in many situations, people will spend probably 50% of their time game playing. Yeah, he goes on in that book to say that, and I always equated this in my mind to the idea of noble silence on retreat or something like this. He goes on to say most talking is an externalization of soothing. Mm -hmm. of, of self stroking. Yep. We, we, mm -hmm. we, we talk because we feel uncomfortable. And while we're talking, we're thinking of something to say. And while we're thinking of something to say, we're not paying attention to how bad we feel. <laughs> or maybe shooting it on someone else. <laughs> right, exactly. Right around. <laughs> and so this is the whole point is let's turn all of this stuff around and start looking on the inside, start looking at the way we feel to start looking at the kind of thoughts that we're having. Are these wholesome thoughts and un and um, are unwholesome thoughts? Are these thoughts that are doing stroking and giving warm fuzzies to ourselves? Or are these critical thoughts? Cold pricklies. OK, you, and the point is, is that we were trained by our society in being very good at cold pricklies and criticism and having unwholesome thoughts. We are actually raised on a diet of unwholesome thoughts. We get it from our parents. Well, where did they get it? They got it from theirs. And where did they get it? They got it from theirs way back in time. In fact, it's very clear in uh, the Christian Bible that Jesus had already run across this problem 2000 years ago. And then it comes clear also in the suttas that the ordinary people that the Buddha had to deal with, they had these problems 2500 years ago. It just keeps going back and back. Who knows where the original sin was? <laughs> But it's not that it was an original sin, it's that it's passed down every generation. Passed he says down. the same of games. Mm -hmm. Oh, the games, psychological. Are, oh, the mm -hmm. games are old. <laughs> We've been playing these games for uh, oh. literally hundreds of centuries. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they're so deeply rooted. They're rooted both in um, instinct and they're also rooted in heavy, heavy training that every young child receives from the society that he's in. And so we have to take our own place. We have to remember that even if somebody's fussing at us or yelling at us, He's not yelling at me. He's just yelling on the inside. That he doesn't even know me. <laughs> OK, and that really gets into play in retreats. Getting back to that. OK, so um, I do not know why the retreats wind up this way. Well, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> if, if, if you have. A, a group of highly skilled meditators that come together in a retreat, then you're probably going to wind up with a good result. That in fact, uh, there is a time of the year that's called Vasa or Panza. The word Vasa is used in Sri Lanka and the word Panza is used in Thailand. The word pond, if you think of a pond like on Golden Pond, the word pond means water. And that in fact, in the Hindi language, Pani is the word for water. And so you can find the, uh, the easy reason for Panza then is the rains retreat or when it's raining, when there is a lot of water in the ground, when it's flooding, et cetera, like that. 
this is the time of the year because um, uh, the farmers are out planting. They don't want the monks trampling through their new planted stuff. The, the monks also don't need to be wallowing in the mud all afternoon and then sleeping in the mud at night. And so they collect together in into a safe place. And then, in fact, every year the monks have to plan in advance where they're going to be cloistered for the next three months. And so we use that Ponza time as a time for staying tight. And in fact, um, Abaya Gary in California has changed the Ponza time from uh, the monsoons in Asia to the winter time in Northern California and that they close the monastery. Sorry, we don't want any guests. We're in retreat now. And so those monks who are skilled at what they're doing can get into cloister, get in together, get into a community, get into a retreat, and it works marvelously. And that's the model then that we use for the retreats that are given to the beginner, the Westerner, the, um, uh, the one who is not skilled in the Dhamma. And it winds up being a torture chamber. <laughs> Why? Because they confiscate your passport and your books and your laptop and your cell phone and any writing materials. And then on top of that, you've got to keep your mouth shut. All right, which means that they're actually precluding us from having any intimacy or any spontaneity at all. You're supposed to be here to follow the instructions, which nobody can. Nobody can follow those instructions. And so what do we do instead? We start playing psychological games. We get up tight. We don't like to retreat. Oh, I want out of here. And as soon as I can find an excuse of somebody who's saying something or doing something, wow, that's all I need, and I'm out of here, and I can quit. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, then the retreat system, the retreat center people begin to judge how good this retreat was, not in the attendance, not on how spontaneous the talk was or how beautiful it was, but rather how many qu people quit. And of people who quit, to, uh, a lot of people who quit to retreat, it was a bad retreat. And a lot of people who stay on the retreat then makes it a good retreat. This is how they, they feel about it. And so if one of the volunteers fusses at one of the students and the student wants to quit, then the volunteer thinks, oh, I have failed because I'm adding to the quit rate, which makes this a bad retreat. OK, so um, the, the reality is, is that um, the volunteers actually are not old masters. Old masters don't volunteer to help another old master do his retreat. OK, we want students to do that. And so always the, uh, the volunteers at a retreat are mostly there for the retreat itself, but they would or should be willing to handle any problems that other students come up with. Unfortunately, if the volunteer is having a bad day or a bad moment and a student comes up and asks a question, he's going to get eaten alive. There we're going to be top dog underdog. OK, this happens a lot. But in fact, the worst case scenario that I know about happened in Jaipur just a couple of years ago at a Gawanka retreat. Now, in India, because of the theft being so bad, I don't know about Thailand, whether they confiscate the passports or not. But in India, at the, uh, uh, there they confiscated the passports also. So they've got your passport. This guy has an incident at the retreat and he wants to leave. And this guy who's got the passport, he won't give him the passport. He says, oh, no, you can't leave here. You've got to stay for the end of the retreat. Why? Because our statistics show that our retreats are bad when people quit. So I'm going to keep your passport hostage to make you stay here. <laughs> OK, now an intelligent person in that situation who is actually intending to quit 
All he needs to do is to go to the local police station. Every Indian town has one and say, these guys have got my passport and I want it back and they won't give it to me and see what the police do. But in fact, if the guy says, I want my, and doesn't go to the police, but stands there and demands the passport, I want my passport, you give me my passport, starts making a whole lot of noise about the passport, guess who calls the police? (laughs) The volunteer, okay. Okay, and so this actually happened at a Goenka retreat. And so we can recognize that the wait, wait a minute, the, the retreats are, they, they're missing something. What are they missing is basically what we don't have missing in the Panza or in the cloister every year, once, a, once to, uh, three months for the monks, because they're not intentionally in silence. There's no rule about it that you can't talk. Now, there's actually a fairly good reason for beginners to have that kind of rule. I've seen it actually happen more than one time. Here's the situation is is that the students, when they have a particularly good time in the meditation, when they when they have a wow experience, when they have uh, um, a uh, um, an enlightenment experience, they want to go advertise it. They want to go tell stories about it, okay? When we go and tell stories about it, guess what? The mind is tricked into a way of what we now remember months later was not the actual experience. It was the story we told about it shortly afterwards. That's what cements those memories into the mind is verbalizing them and telling about them that in fact that experience probably two or three or four days from now is not even going to be important because we've had new experiences. But if I go and run around and tell all the people this experience that I've had, that locks that experience in to the memory, keeps it going, and makes it more and more important. But it has another effect on the students, and that is the people who have to listen to this guy jawbone about what a marvelous experience he had get jealous. (laughs) And they want an experience like that, too, and that kind of disrupts their own practice. Oh, I got to stop doing what I'm doing and getting the value out of that. I've got to go do what that de- guy did so I can get what he's jawboning about so that I can go around this retreat and jawbone about it too. <laughs> All right. So this is the value of the silence. It's got a value to it, but it's often abused. How is it abused? It's abused because... Um, and in fact, they add the word noble silence. And the question is, is that what do, what's the difference between silence and noble silence? The difference between silence and noble silence, we have to really look at it from the sense of nobility. And that is, is that a noble silence can mean that you actually have some intimacy with other people. You just don't have to go jawboning about it that you can have a friendly attitude. You can, in fact, uh, be spontaneous. You can, in fact, have that intimacy. And that one would be the noble silence. You're just not speaking, but you have other ways of communicating, okay? And uh, it's often then in an ordinary situation with ordinary students, they think that noble silence means super strict silence. (laughs) <laughs> over the top silence. I've had people write messages on their iPhone and then show it to me because they didn't want to talk. Exactly. Like sign, sign language. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So the question would be is that noble or not? And of course, uh, you don't know. That's why. What is the message? If the message is noble, then it's a noble message. And more than likely, it's not. (laughs) More than likely is, what are we going to do when we get out of here? (laughs) 
off into the future kind of stuff. But a little message, a text message with a smiley face that says, I really love your smile at this retreat. That would be a noble thing to say. That would be a warm fuzzy. As opposed to a cold prickly. So. <laughs> um, when when we are in those retreats that way, because of the situation, we're actually super sensitive. Super sensitive means that we're sensitive the way that we always were, but we're even more so. <laughs> so we're more vulnerable. We feel more like a victim. That if, in fact, we were getting really, really good benefit out of the meditation, then these guys, when they would say something cold and quickly to us, the uh, the managers or the uh, the volunteers, just going to let it go right by us. But if we allow it to come in, then that means that we actually own it. We actually set ourselves up as a target to let that cold prickly hit us. As opposed to just miss us. And so, um, all right, so I cannot say that a good retreat would be a good retreat where the volunteers don't hassle the students ever. I couldn't say that because the volunteers are ordinary people with their ordinary stuff in those ordinary retreats anyway. And so what that volunteer was giving you, Daniel, was his own grief. And his grief just happened to have matched with your grief. And so off you go. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I do have to say, uh, 10 seconds longer than normally become green for myself. That's an achievement. Progress. Yeah. <laughs> well, Progress. that's the whole, right. That's the whole point is, is that can we learn from this so that it doesn't get repeated over and over again? We can, we could do this. I mean, you could go and do the next 12 retreats and leave every one of them early because some volunteer had his uh, nose out of joint. But in fact, we could go around finding the volunteers who have their nose out of joint just so that we could set them off and make them do that so that we get an excuse to leave the retreat if that's the excuse you need. Oh, I, I need to leave this retreat because the volunteers are bad. But others find other reasons to leave the retreat, like the food's not good enough, or mm -hmm. the teacher is boring, or the, the bed is hard. too hard. Yep. <laughs> All kinds of. He likes the wooden pillow. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> well, it takes a skill. Yeah. So, so to um, to to move this thing around in in the circle and make the completion is is that when we are in a victim's position, then we are easily victimized, even by other people who consider themselves a victim and are just lashing out. All right, so. The question is, can we come back to, in our practice, I can do this. I can handle this. I can, in fact, give myself warm fuzzies. I don't have to give myself a second cold prickly just because that guy gave me a cold prickly. But in fact, this is much more to do not just with the retreats themselves. This is just an example of any time that you're criticized. Mm. Because when you when you are criticized, there's selfishness in there. There's a you that is capable of being criticized. We make ourselves a target. But in fact, even if the guy is wrong and misses you completely, you'll go move yourself over into where that arrow is, is uh, headed so that you can get struck <laughs> by it anyway. He missed his target and you moved as a moving target to move over there just so that you can get hit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. That's how much of a victimhood we have learned to play in our lives. Is it all? 
he missed me, but he was intending to hit me. Let me go be his victim anyway. Instead of the winner says, oh, he missed that one. <laughs> it went right by. It went right over my head. It didn't get me at all. Okay, so this is the way that we begin to understand that any criticism is, in fact, like that. It's not ever actually intended for you. It's merely, let us say, uh, inaccurate shooting of a guy who's got a loaded weapon that he shouldn't have, his mouth. <laughs> well, what if I could laugh about it? Maybe that would help in that situation. Well, I and think you're maybe... pretty good. Yeah, but you're laughing three days later. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> how but can you yeah. how can you laugh right then and there when when we're criticized? When someone else is giving us a cold prickly, what can we do? You don't have to take it as a gift. You don't have to receive it. The Buddha actually has a sutta about that where some guy got out really uptight and angry and came to the Buddha to complain, and the Buddha just let him jawbone. He just let him go yap, 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 yap. And when he uh, was finished with, uh, I'm thinking of the fact that in the sutta, the Buddha says, are you finished? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I say that, I would probably get sent away. <laughs> no, no, because then the Buddha said, and you can handle this and in any situation, the Buddha told the guy a story or actually asked him a question. And that is because this was a high class Brahmin, you know, they give uh, um, ceremonies and weddings and feasts and all kinds of stuff. In fact, uh, in those days, it was uh, almost a requirement that you had to give big meals. And so he said, well, what if you gave a big meal and you had invited guests and nobody came to your party? Who owns the food that you prepared for those guests at the party? Who owns it? Nobody ate it. Okay. Daniel, who owns that food? Uh, well, the, the, the party owner. Right, uh, the guy who party. was throwing the party. Okay. Party thrower, yeah. So if you throw a pity party and nobody comes, who gets all of the pity? <laughs> I do. All right. <laughs> if if you have an anger party and you can't get anybody to come play your game and can't get anybody else angry, then who owns that anger? Uh, the, the anger, the anger try. All right. So now we can look at that in two directions. The two directions is coming and going. All right. If somebody comes with anger and I don't receive that anger that I can step out of the way, then that guy owns that anger. It belongs to him. He was the one who was doing it. All right. You could have, in fact, played that at the retreat to where that anger that this volunteer is expressing is his. It's not yours. It only became yours when you owned it. Oh, that's me he's angry at. But if Whether I would the, say that to him, it would, yeah. It, then I would kind of do it to satisfy my own ego, like, oh, I'm better than you. Because, uh -huh. <laughs> I don't, because I don't accept your anger, I am holier than thou. So. <laughs> uh, but in fact, if you don't accept his anger, then anger, then you are holier than he is in the sense of wholeness. To where he is a scat. I mean, he's on fire. His logs are burning, and he's got smoke and all of this kind of stuff. And so, when someone is angry, we're all over the place not unified. If you do not accept his anger, then you are still whole. You are holier than he is. Now, the expression holier than thou means um, uh, a kind of a put down. But we're in this case, we're not putting him down. We're just not receiving his anger. In fact, one of the things that you could have said when you started to talk to him and he rebuffs you with all of that anger, 
And I was, you could say, well, it looks like you're having a bad day today. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, but yeah, I'm not going to lie. Like if I would say that, I would be doing it in a really smug way and <laughs> like putting him down. Ah, anyway. But smart, even if it's smart Alex, smart and wisdom is better than being the underdog victim that you chose instead. I'll, I'll take that. I'll accept that. <laughs> yeah, th I can live with that. Okay, so in every case, we have an option. If we know we have an option. I bet at that particular time when he said that, you did not have the option of stepping out of his way and recognizing that his anger was his. Oh, no, you had to buy it. And you uh, paid a pretty penny. very personal. <laughs> yeah, you took it very personal, exactly. All right. Let this be your lesson. This may be the last time that you have to deal with another person angry if you can take this in and remember. Can you <laughs> remember that his anger is not your anger? That he is giving you a gift that you do not receive. You do not <laughs> take it. You do not join his pity party. <laughs> so, and how you respond after that is up to you whether it's smart aleck smart or wise it doesn't matter at least it's not being the victim one other way to I think of it is always be the host the host is always the master they're always letting the guest in so if you are taking anything from anyone always be the host you're not mm -hmm. his guest you know he wants to he's knocking on your door you're hosting yeah. hmm I'm just going to shut the door in his face. <laughs> Happily with a big smile. <laughs> Happily <laughs> with a big smile. <laughs> okay. But see, when we are kids, when we're little kids, we respond to anger with great fear. That in fact, uh, adults get angry at kids to make them afraid. But then there is something else, and that is, is that I have seen this very often. I see it quite often, um, haven't seen it for a while. But here's the situation. When a parent or an adult gets angry at a kid, the kid goes into the state of fear, which is also the state of freeze. They'll stand there <laughs> like that, all right? Which means they're not listening, they're not paying attention, and they're not doing what they're told to do, which then pisses the adult off even more. And so now you get a vicious cycle going to where the kid is all frozen with fear and the, and the adult is getting angrier and angrier and tighter and more and giving the, the kid all of these instructions about what you're supposed to do, like don't leave your books at school or whatever the thing is, and the kid's not listening at all, he's too afraid. He's looking for those blows to come. He's looking for that belt to come out or that switch or that hand to come slapping across the face because they're terrified, all right? How many of you have ever been terrified when you were kids? Yeah. We right. all get terrified, right? <laughs> all right. We, so after we learn how to be terrified and go into that frozen state, we repeat that, maybe not for such a long period of time. I've seen kids frozen in, in, uh, uh, in terror for five minutes. Now we can get it down to five seconds. The question is, can you stop being that child that is the focus of that attention of anger and be the adult that's watching this guy miss the target completely? They're bad shots. When people are angry, they're really notoriously bad shots. They can't get you. You have to actually move to get in their target range so that they can get you. You actually have to go buy that anger. You have to go maneuver yourself to get into it so that you can get hit with that anger. 
And in fact, one of the things that's telling about that is you said that you were in a really, really good state until this happened. And then all of a sudden, wham. OK, which means yeah. you had to travel a long distance to get yourself in the position <laughs> of getting shot. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And so that's the way of looking at it. Back to this whole point about the time structuring and the fact that we can structure our time around giving ourselves warm fuzzies. Because we've been trained into these cold pricklies. We've been trained into anger, into morose, into uh, uh, fear. And we can train ourselves through practice of Anapanasati in, uh, at least right now, look on the bright side of life. At least right now, I don't have to get hit with that arrow. I can get out of this way. Or if I do get shot, pull it out immediately. Get over it really quickly. I like what you told me last night. The ordinary person gets shot with the arrow. They go to the doctor and then they argue with the doctor. They don't go to pull it out. They just dark. <laughs> exactly. That's in the sutta, by the way, that we, that we were talking about. That we're talking about yep. sutta number 63 um, <laughs> um, in the Majjhima Nikaya, where this guy gets shot by an arrow. And the ordinary person starts arguing with the uh, what happened, where did this come from, and all of that kind of stuff. What to color where the, was the guy that shot me? <laughs> mm -hmm. So many questions. <laughs> so many, many. I think that that suit was actually overdone with how many questions they could ask. I mean, right down to the feathers <laughs> on the arrow. Nice. I love it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, looking at that, we can say then that. The beginning noble, the Sotapan, is the one who will get shot and then wait until it hurts. And then he'll pull the arrow out. Okay. And then the next level above that is the Sotagami, which means that when he gets hit by that arrow, he's going to wait a while and get recovered enough so that he can pull it out. I mean, imagine yourself getting shot with an arrow. And you're laying there and say, you know, I could pull this arrow out if I wanted to. <laughs> Let me get the strength and pull this thing out. OK. Kind of like a so buffer. The, mm -hmm. So the ordinary person doesn't get the arrow taken out. He'd rather argue with the doctor. The soda <laughs> pond will wait until it really hurts and then get the, uh, the, the muscle to get it out. The soda gami will wait only until he can get his strength back so that he can pull it out. The anagami may or may not get hit. He can see it coming and he may de dodge so that it gets him in a, uh, let us say, less than full frontal mode. That he doesn't get shot in the chest, he gets shot over on the, on the side or something like that, maybe in the arm. And what he does then is he immediately removes that arrow. I think, in fact, uh, 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 Alex, we had talked about that one time when you saw that I had gotten shot by an arrow. I pulled that thing right out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> get it done. <laughs> get it out. Get it done. Yeah, yeah. I'm over that. So mm -hmm. one remark, okay. And then the next one is the arrowhot, who is welcome, who is looking. He is seeing what's going on, and he sees that arrow in the air, and he stands right out of its way. OK, so here here we go. At least, Daniel, you didn't argue with me when we talked about pulling yeah. that arrow out. <laughs> <laughs> that you at least can help the, the surgeon pull that arrow out to get that out. And in fact, that arrow was not yours in the first place. It was just misfired. And you were just a bystander. That guy who fussed at you, that was not you he was fussing at until you made it you who he was fussing at. He was just fussing at a student. And collateral damage. Yes. <laughs> and you did your own damage. You stood in the way and you got hit by that arrow. And, and old poor me limping out of the uh, retreat, wounded. <laughs> 
when the choice is you could pull that arrow out at any particular time. Are you going to pull it out immediately? You're going to pull it out an hour later? Or are you going to wait for days until you talk to the doctor? <laughs> Okay, so but it's always your choice. The question is, when will you wake up to the fact that you've got a choice that you could pull that arrow out? And if you were really fast and awake in the first place, you'd have never gotten hit by it. Oh, he's just telling you some student that I don't even know. <laughs> you can see from afar, maybe he's having a rough day. So just approaching him, mm -hmm. you could get ready. Right. Exactly right. That the Arahat's not even going to go talk to that particular volunteer. Well, it was really very, very strange because he had a big smile on his face. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then as soon as you spoke, he, he, a, <laughs> yeah, he told me he had a bad, uh, or that he had something going on in his meditation. That's what oh, he well, let's. Let's mention that at least that in fact he you didn't leave immediately. You stayed around long enough for him to come around to give a, a kind of an apology, though he didn't actually say, oh, I'm so sorry that I screwed up by being arguing with you. But he said it in a gentle way anyway. He appreciated the tone. And uh, well, I was uh, too sensitive. And, uh, apparently, it was the age difference that made me feel offended. So, that's people his age, apparently, it's all right for them to Okay. So, you could have taken what he had to say as an apology that was a good enough apology. And you could then say, oh, it's okay. I'm staying on the retreat anyway. Everything is good to go. But instead... Uh, you you still took what he said uh, the second time as kind of a cold prickly. It wasn't good enough apology. Yeah, it felt kind of hard-hearted. Like, uh, if, I, if I'm honest, it felt like he was not humble enough to admit. <laughs> That's what I'm getting at, exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. That's, that's, that's how I thought about it. <laughs> it may not be uh, correct, but. Well, in a way, I'm, about it. it's not a matter of whether I'm right or not. I'm just repeating what you said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's where we can then learn the lesson is, is that. In fact, all of it was your choice. Everything that happened was your choice. And that when we're not watching, then the choices that we make are our default choices. And that's what you did is you built into your default choice. Oh, he's angry at me. When did we get that choice? When did we develop that um, default position? Probably when we were still in diapers. Mm -hmm. Maybe when we run into the coffee table on accident. Mm-hmm. We blame the coffee table. Oh, damn coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> coffee table has a self. Mm. <laughs> well, I do know where it comes from because in the past, uh, I've had situations where people get mad at me for no reason. Mm -hmm. and then I don't Everybody really gets it. angry at no for no reason. Everyone yes. gets angry for no reason. And then we will shoot our arrows of anger at the wrong person every it time. Like if, I, if I don't do anything about it, if I, I don't stand up for myself, then people are going to misuse it. Uh, and they think, oh, he's just weak and uh, I can talk like I can talk disrespectfully to him. And I feel That's like uh, I put myself in an underdog position when I don't respond to it. I know. That's a story that's a... I've told myself a long time, Daniel. A mm -hmm. long time I used to tell myself that story. Nowadays, one of the things I think is, A, who cares, be happy. But two, if it's really, really, really bad, if someone's really doing something that may cross a line, one of the things I do, and, and people hate it when you do this to them because it really puts them in a spot. 
I say, you know, one of the ways that I show you respect is by speaking to you in a kind tone of voice. I would really appreciate it if you could speak to me in that same way. Otherwise, we should probably stop speaking. And at that point, if they disagree, well, really, you can't really label yourself an asshole much more clearly. You know, and if they do agree, then the conversation is good again. You're and right. also, <laughs> yeah, you know, and the guy that is actually in control, the real guy that doesn't get disrespected is the guy that stays calm. You know, the guy that understands that no matter what is going to happen, he can take care of it. You know, and I know for a long time I felt like I couldn't take care of myself like I wanted to. So I'd get uppity. If anybody looked yeah. at me, I might go crazy at him, you know. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, it's a lot more reasonable. And not just that, but you feel like a stud. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you can stand tall in front of someone and say, hey, one of the ways I show you respect is by not raising my voice, is by right. not speaking rudely. Please return that. Well, then, you you know, you just give yourself that pat. Because if they freak out, well, they freak out. But you gave them the arrow back, you know. You gave them a second chance to not be the asshole. Yeah, you, you can't lose if you say that. That's, that's yeah. true. Mm-hmm. Now, Daniel, you mentioned stand up for yourself. That is an oh, yeah. ordinary teaching. OK, yeah. to stand up for yourself means that you were sitting down and he was shooting the arrow where you would be <laughs> standing and you actually go get you go stand up just so that you can get shot by his arrow. That's what standing up for yourself means now. Um, that's often used with with bullies. Oh, the kid comes home and he's crying because the guy's been bullying him again today. And the dad will say, oh, you've got to stand up for yourself. And maybe if it's a girl, he will give her karate lessons <laughs> or something to stand up for themselves. All right. So in a worst case situation, the bullies are, would be in prison. And all the prisoners think they've got to stand up for themselves. The answer to that is no. Here's the point. In, in school, if the bully comes up and. Did we all freeze? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, only Donna, I think. Uh, not getting. OK, I, yeah, we just lost it. So anyway, I'm back. The <laughs> the bully at school, if if he uh, bullies you and you do not respond the way that he would expect you to respond and he gets confused. He may try to bully you more, but if he can't bully you more, he'll quit trying. He'll go bully someone else who plays his game with him. Yeah, which is exactly what Alex is saying. There's many the other things day, that you can say. I'm not going to play this game. The other day I walked past a uh, liquor store while I was on. I was doing some food deliveries, you know, making a little money. Uh, Uber Eats. And um, as I was walking past this liquor store, there was a nice car parked outside of it. And so I looked at it because it's a nice car. It's nice to look at nice cars. And the guy came out and I could tell he was in a mood already. And he came out and he goes, what the fuck are you looking at my shit for? You know, and he got really aggressive about it. I said, because I like it, sir. And he got confused immediately, <laughs> first off, because I don't think he was quite the response he wanted, you know? And he started to talk real quietly. I said, I can't hear what you just said to me. And so he got in his car and he drove away. And I was like, well, that was a much better resolution than it would have been two years ago. You know, that would have been a, a good reason to get all kinds of up in arms. But really, if you yeah. have Saki right there, Oh, Saki yeah, you got to stand that. up for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't have to stand up for ourselves. We do not have to make ourselves a target. We could just sit and smile. The example that I would often give for the 14 year old, though it's too late for him, and that is the kid sees the bully and his two friends walking around the corner instead of getting petrified, he walks towards them and past them, and he walks quickly. Okay, and so the um, uh, the um the bully is going to be confused by that and he'll try to stop you and he says oh where are you going and you just keep right on going saying oh i'm in a hurry i'll talk to you later <laughs> and you just move you just go you do not live you do not stand there to let him make you a target you just walk right away so, and if yeah, he tries to stop mm -hmm, don't play those games 
All right, so. I like uh, that one. You it sounds like Angulimara. And the 999 right. fingers, just walking, mm -hmm. walking, walking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just keep, just keep walking. And that makes you to not be a target. So instead of standing up for yourself, which is what we're taught, we can say, oh, let's just take a hike. <laughs> <laughs> let's put some distance you know the more distance we have the less likely he is uh, uh, to be able to uh, hit an accurate uh, hit accurately his target because he doesn't even know what he's shooting at anyway that's the real thing that's the that's the clincher where he thinks he knows you he thinks he's talking about you and he misses you completely let that be yep. yeah 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 because I validate his, his feelings, his actions, by responding the way I do. Mm-hmm. Because you've got a choice, if you know that you've got a choice. That's what we're practicing in Anapanasati, is to remember you've got a choice. Every moment you've got a choice, if you can remember that you've got a choice. And when we practice on Anapanasati sufficiently, we get to see dependent co-arising in action. We get to see that sense contact conditions feeling, you know? So when you hear those words, blap, there's feeling. And that feeling conditions craving, and that craving conditions clinging, and that clinging conditions becoming. Mm -hmm. Becoming conditions birth, aging, death, the whole mass of suffering. <laughs> You've been reading the suttas. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and wrap this up with the um, uh, 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 the stuff around Eric Byrne and the games people play. He talks about time structuring, so start paying attention to how you structure your time because there's wholesome ways to structure your time with intimacy and spontaneity, or there's the dangerous ones like um, uh, rituals where they may or may not work, activities may or not work, and then there's the downright unwholesome game playing that we do, trying to find winners and losers. So that's the first thing that we can get out of this talk today, is look at how we're structuring our time. And then we can use Eric Burns' language in the sense of warm fuzzies versus cold pricklies and start looking at the kind of thoughts that you have. Start having warm, fuzzy thoughts and start recognizing that cold, prickly thoughts are uncomfortable anyway. I mean, we <laughs> talk ourselves into feeling bad by having cold, prickly thoughts. Let's stop having those cold, prickly thoughts and start having some warm nurturing. Everything is OK. Allow yourself to become unified in your mind, to become a whole person, to become holier. Mm. You can become holy. That's one of the reasons that this is a joke coming. One, that's one of the reasons why I go barefoot most of the time. I only wear shoes to the bank or to immigration. Other than that, 100 day after day, I'm, on, I, uh, I'm barefoot. You know why? Because in Genesis, when Moses climbed the mountain at the burning bush, he says, Moses, take off thy shoes for thou art upon holy ground. Oh. Okay, mm -hmm. and so the West, the uh, the Christians in America would ask me that, why do I go around holy? And the answer to that is because I'm in danger of being upon holy ground at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> All I have to do is recognize this is holy ground here. This is holy. It's sufficient. It's good enough. It is whole. That's how we're going to do it, is to recognize that you do not have to be holier than thou. The than thou is his issue. Your job is to just be holy, to be sufficient, to be good. You don't have to stand up to defend yourself. You don't have to stand up for yourself. In fact, that self is not worth defending. <laughs> it's painful to defend that self. <laughs> It's dangerous. Mm. 
that in fact you can joke with him is you can say oh i think you're in the wrong prison cell the guy that you're really angry at is in that <laughs> other cell over there <laughs> here we've got nothing but joy <laughs> Oh, uh, that's 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 a great one. I'm, I'm going to borrow that because if I would have said that, I would have liked to see the look on his face and on my own face. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for this talk. This has been a great. Yeah, Thanks, been Alex. Been You've been really thank great in this one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sangha. Thank you, Thanks, guys. We'll see you guys again soon. <laughs> see you again, guys. Thank you for coming. Much peace. Bye bye. See ya.